Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group, where we study the words of the Buddha. We're using this book series titled "The Words of the Buddha: The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden," and we're moving from volumes two up to volume thirteen, which is the entire book series aside from volume one, which is. Explored in the group learning program, which is done on Sunday and Wednesdays. But on Saturdays, we go through this book series ten chapters at a time, and we're now in volume nine, chapters twenty-one through thirty. This particular book is all about the six sense bases and training to understand how the mind is longing and yearning through these six sense bases, and that it's important to guard the mind with mindfulness or awareness of mind, so that you can then restrain the mind and you can pull it back, so that as the mind is longing and yearning through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue. Bodily contact in the mind; these six sense bases. The mind is longing and yearning for these pleasant feelings. When you observe that the mind is having these conditioned pleasant feelings, you can observe that as a bodily sensation and cut that off and let it go, so it doesn't arise this happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria, where the mind is uncalm and shaken up. That doesn't arise in the mind because if you allow that to happen, then it's only a matter of time before these painful. Feelings of sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, and other feelings like this arise in the mind. So it's only a matter of time if you allow these conditioned, pleasant feelings to arise in the mind that. Then these painful feelings are going to arise in the mind of anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, and fear. So the way to train the mind is to understand these six sense bases as part of this volume nine, and how the mind is longing and yearning for these pleasant feelings through these six sense bases. The mind wants agreeable forms, it wants agreeable sounds, it wants agreeable odors, it wants agreeable. Flavors. It wants agreeable physical objects and agreeable mental objects. And as long as the mind gets those things, then with this agreeable contact, there's these conditioned pleasant feelings that arise. But they're impermanent because they're based on some impermanent condition. So when those conditions aren't met, then the mind goes to this. Painful feelings. These conditioned painful feelings now of anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, and others. And now the mind is just going up and down and up and down because of the mental longing and strong eagerness, the craving, desire, attachment. So the way to get a handle on this is through understanding the six sense bases and understanding all the other teachings that the Buddha shares related to this path to enlightenment. And understanding the six sense bases helps you to understand. Understand that fetter of central desire and the central pleasures, and the way that the mind just fills itself up with all this yearning and longing through these sense bases. So, the more you understand how the mind is longing for pleasant feelings and experiencing painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant, then you can see that the mind is doing this, and you can actively train it to no longer do that. Where the mind is in the middle, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Where you can still enjoy. Enjoy things. You can still have an enjoyable life, but the mind's not clinging to it and holding on to it, arising these conditioned pleasant feelings. Until the mind is willing to let go of these temporary conditioned pleasant feelings, it will never experience this permanent joy. So the mind has to get 
comfortable with letting go of these conditioned pleasant feelings, these temporary pleasant feelings, so that it can eliminate the pollution of craving, desire, attachment, so that it can now come into its own and experience this permanent joy. And it was very counterintuitive to what we're typically taught in life. We're taught to chase after material objects or relationships or other things. And this is what's going to bring us happiness. But that happiness is never permanent because it's based on some impermanent condition. So being in the middle means that we pursue things as a goal, objective, or an interest, but we don't have this mental longing and strong eagerness. And that's where you can eliminate the conditioned pleasant feelings, conditioned painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. So the mind can come into its own and experience this brightness or this radiance, this higher consciousness, where your decisions aren't motivated by your own selfish desires your central desires. So when we eliminate this from the mind, now we experience this peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because nothing can shake up the mind. So you're learning that as part of this book of volume nine. And I'd like to welcome all of you who've decided to join for today's class, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, the podcast, and Zoom, or any other places that we distribute content. And even if you're listening to this on the replay, which I know a lot of people do, I'd like to welcome you guys to today's class. The way that we start is with a brief meditation just to prepare the mind and allow us to then be able to retain the teachings of the Buddha for a longer and longer period of time. So I'll just do a little bit of guidance just to kind of do like a little top-up meditation for just like maybe 10 minutes or so. And then we'll go into reading these chapters 21 through 30. If you're in Zoom, you can volunteer to do that with our moderators. And as each student reads a chapter, I will then teach and then I'll open up to any questions that you have. And if you haven't read these chapters, it's okay because we're gonna read them in class, but in future classes, you might decide to download these books so that then you can read ahead of time. And you just go to buddhadailywisdom.com and you'll see the button for downloading the free books. So go ahead and get your body in a comfortable position, not luxurious, not painful, but comfortable. Just close the eyes, and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. This is just gonna establish the breath. Just getting the breath nice and established as the breath is the present moment. Breathing in and out. You're welcome to join the chanting and then I'll be back with a little bit more guidance. Arahang Samma Samhoto Makewa Potang Makewa Nang Apiwa Teomi Sawakato Makewata Damang Namasami Supatipano Makawato Sawakasanko Sanghang Namami Nap more sabhagavato Arato Sama Saputasa Nap more sabhagavato Arato Sama Saputasa Nap more sabhagavato Arato Sama Saputasa Iti Piso Mahakawa Arahang Sama Samoto 
विचाचारणसमुनो सखातो रोकावितो अनुतेरो दामासाती सातातवा मानुसनं भूतो भगवती Okay, you should be breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Your breath isn't going to sync up to the guidance I'm providing because this is your practice. So wherever you get to the next inhale, just breathe in gradually through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Notice the gap between the inhale and exhale. And then exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in and out. Fixate the mind on the sound of the breath this, the, or the sensation coming into the nose of the air. The sound of the breath or the sensation of air, that's the present moment. Fixate the mind on the present moment, the breath. Breathing in and out. Whenever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. I'm going to let you do this work now of just focusing on the breath. Breathing in. in out
to slowly make your way out of meditation. I'd like to welcome anyone who's joined us since we started meditating. We just do a meditation here at the beginning of class just as a little top-up for the mind to help you focus better and have more concentration, clarity of mind, and deeper memory during the class so you can retain the teachings for a longer period, therefore implementing them into your life more easily. But anybody who's studying in this program Perhaps you might have it well established in your life where you're doing two or three meditations a day for 30 minutes or more because that would be what you need to truly get to enlightenment. So I'd like to just turn things over to all of you as we continue forward in reading chapters 21 through 30. There's a student who will volunteer to read. Then after we read, I will share any teachings on that particular chapter and then open up to any questions that you guys might have related to the specific chapter. So I'll just turn things over to all of you guys to go forward in class. And thank you all for being here to be dedicated to learning the teachings of the Buddha. We'll go to Jan to read chapter 21. Thank you, Manal. One must put forth extra intention, effort, and energy. Monks, though a monk be not skilled in the habit of others' thoughts, at least he can resolve. I will be skilled in the habit of my own thought. Thus, monks, should you train yourselves. And how is a monk skilled in the habit of his own thought? Just as if monks, a woman or man or a young child, fond of self-adornment, examining the reflection of his own face in a bright clean mirror or bowl of clear water, should see there is a stain or speck and strive for the removal of that stain or speck. And when he no longer sees it, there is pleased and satisfied because of that thinking, again, it is to me that I'm clean. So amongst pondering is most fruitful in good conditions. Thus, do I, or do I not generally live with sensual desire, craving? 
Do I or do I not generally live with ill will in the mind? Do I or do I not generally live possessed by complacency? Do I or do I not generally live restlessness and worry in mind? Do I generally live in doubt or have I crossed beyond it? Do I generally live with anger or not? Do I generally live with soiled thoughts or clean thoughts? Do I generally live with body aroused or not? Do I generally live sluggish or full of energy? Do I generally live uncontrolled or well-controlled? Monks, if on examination a monk finds thus, I generally live with sensual desire, craving, ill will in mind, possessed by complacency, restlessness and worry in mind, doubtful, angry, with soiled thoughts, with body aroused, sluggish and uncontrolled, then that monk must put forth extra intention, inclination, aim, effort, energy, mindfulness and concentration for the abandoning of these evil, unwholesome states. Just as monks, when one's turban or head is ablaze, for the extinguishing thereof, one must put forth extra intention, inclination, aim, effort, energy, determined mindfulness and concentration. Even so, for the abandoning of those evil and wholesome states, one must do the same. But if on examination, a monk finds thus, I do not generally live with sensual desire, craving, ill will in mind, possessed by complacency, restlessness and worry in mind, doubtful, angry, with soiled thoughts, with body aroused, sluggish and uncontrolled, then that monk should make an effort to establish just those wholesome states and further to destroy the fetters, taints or pollution. All right. Thank you, Jan. So I'm going to walk you guys through this kind of generally and how the Buddha is talking and what he's talking about here. This first part, what he's really talking about, he's talking about reflection. And when I talk about learning, reflection, and practice, what he's talking about here is reflecting and kind of looking inward to uncover, you know, what it is that's going on in the mind. And do you have these aspects of the mind? And he talks about the five hindrances here. That's what these first five are here. Are These are the five hindrances that hinder you from experiencing enlightenment. Central desire, ill will, complacency, restlessness, and worry, and doubt. And there's ways to eliminate these. There's direct antidotes to them. But if you weren't reflecting and looking inward to determine whether these were actually there or not at any given time, using mindfulness or awareness of mind and doing that inner reflection, then you wouldn't know to actually implement the solution. So part of this is learning what the five hindrances are, understanding what their remedies are and then reflecting on the and looking to see if you see any of these aspects of the mind there and then when you do then you practice the direct solutions or antidotes to those and that's how you actually eliminate them so that you can continue to make progress on the path and these other ones that he's talking about here too are other aspects of the mind anger soiled thoughts or unwholesome thoughts, bodily aroused, this would be central desire as part of craving desire attachment, sluggish or full of energy, this would be related to that enlightenment factor of energy where you have motivation, encouragement, a willingness to do something, enthusiasm, and then the mind should be well controlled, not uncontrolled. If your mind's uncontrolled, then you're going to notice that it's going to be shaken up with these pleasant feelings, these painful feelings and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. But someone who's training the mind well through meditation and all the other steps of the full path will have this well controlled mind where you can control the mind because you've developed this mental discipline. So the Buddha is explaining here to do that and he's relating it to a person who has their head ablaze like a turban you know this must have also been common during his lifetime that people wore turbans in the area that he was living in and if you notice that your head is on fire and you've got this turban on your head you're going to put extra effort 
or inclination, aim, effort, energy, determination, diligence to eliminate this blaze, right? So this mindfulness and concentration that the Buddha is talking about, this is what's going to allow you to look inward and abandon these unwholesome states that he's talking about. These unwholesome states are the ones that he details up here, all 10 of those. And then he just kind of re explains them down here that if you notice that you don't have these in the mind, then you should continue to work to destroy all the other fetters because some of those five hindrances and the other things you mentioned are part of the 10 fetters. So if the mind doesn't have these things, where if the mind doesn't generally have craving, if it doesn't have ill will, if it doesn't have complacency, restlessness, and worry, doubt, anger, soiled thoughts, body aroused, sluggish or uncontrolled mind, if it doesn't have those, then you're really making progress and you're observing that the condition of the mind is really improving. And the Buddha is saying, okay, from that point, then continue forward and cultivating and establishing, applying effort to cultivate these wholesome mental states and further destroy the remaining fetters. Because there's things like desire for form, desire for formless, conceit, there's ignorance, there's other things like this that are part of the 10 fetters that aren't mentioned here in this particular teaching. But he says, okay, if these things don't exist in the mind, then continue forward. Keep applying diligence and dedication to eliminate the rest of the fetters. And this requires you to just be aware of what's going on in the mind and taking that time occasionally throughout your week where you're looking inward and observing and reflecting on what's going on in the mind and what's been happening in your relationships. That inward looking eye is really important as you progress towards enlightenment and doing that objectively, not just having conceit and arrogance and thinking everything you're doing is so wonderful, but also not diminishing yourself and making yourself feel degraded or diminished either. It's finding that middle way where you can objectively look at the mind. You can observe like, okay, here's some areas for improvement, some things that I would like to improve based on what the Buddha is pointing out to us that we we need to improve in the mind. Now let me work on that. And of course, I'm not going to be able to snap my fingers and instantly put that stuff into practice, but I'm going to gradually work towards improving those things. And then when you're doing this inner reflection and you see certain things objectively that you feel like you're doing well, then continue to do those things, support those, encourage them, allow them to continue to permeate in the mind. And this is what that inward looking eye is going to help you develop by having mindfulness and concentration. You can look inward, identify things that are unwholesome, identify things that are wholesome, eliminate the unwholesome and continue to arise the wholesome. And this is where the mind will continue to progress forward to enlightenment. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? We have a question from Amina on Zoom. She asks, a question please, when at times the mind is complacent and in need of energy and aim, where should the mind first look to ignite that flame to arrive at the middle way? The Buddha teaches to eliminate complacency is to investigate the teachings because when the mind's complacent, it wants to just be complacent. It has this dullness, this lethargic condition. The way that you ignite the mind and get out of that complacency is you got to pull up your pants, put on your boots and dig into the books, the videos, coming to classes and things like this. And now when you're investigating the teachings, it can spring up this energy in the mind. And then that springs up the joy. Those are the second, third, and fourth factors of enlightenment. And the first factor of enlightenment is mindfulness. These are tools to fine tune the mind. These aren't to determine if you are enlightened. They're tools to fine tune the mind. So that first factor of enlightenment is mindfulness or awareness of mind. That's what's helping you to observe whether there is complacency. And then when there is and the mind's more sluggish, that's where you investigate the teachings. This brings up energy. This brings up joy. And then you can only do that for so many hours in a day or so many hours in a particular week. So if you observe that you're relaxing and you're resting like on a sofa or in a chair and that's important for you at that particular time, then you do that. But then you're not interested in allowing that to become days upon days upon days where you're just sitting around the house doing nothing. Instead, you need to have that enthusiasm to take care of this physical body, to nourish the body with 
good wholesome food, to spend time with your family, to spend time to get to know your neighbors and the people around you. So this is that enthusiasm, that interest and willingness to do something. So it's the investigating the teachings that helps to spring that up in the mind. But then you also need to practice this enthusiasm and willingness to do something in other parts of your life too. Because as the mind becomes more and more enlightened, there's kind of a tendency to unplug from the world a bit because you see all this discontentedness and suffering in the world and you're working on going internal and working on your own enlightenment. And there's kind of this tendency to go into seclusion and kind of pull back from the world. And you can do that for certain periods of time during your day or during your week or what have you. But there also needs to be this certain aspect of the mind where you're willing to go out into the community and talk to people and interact with people because an enlightened being isn't going to just stay in a cave all the time, right? They're going to come out and interact with people and they're going to be able to do that with ease. So to find this middle where you find times that you need to be resting and taking care of certain things for your own personal needs or your family's needs, you do that. But then also you find time to interact with others occasionally too, as you need to do that. And that's where you can find that middle with enthusiasm in this willingness to do something where the mind doesn't stay in this sluggish, lethargic condition. Okay, looks like Jan has her hand raised for a question. We'll go to her. Thank you, Manal. Thank you, Teacher David. I've been working quite a bit to try to eliminate the habit of the mind just going back to the past and kind of dwelling on something that happened in the past. It creeps up on me. I'll be driving, for example, and uh, I try to just drive. I don't have the radio on or anything of that sort. Um, I'll be driving and then I'll find that I'm replaying something that happened in the past in my mind, right? So I have to kind of come back to now. And I'm working on it, and it doesn't seem to be getting much better very quickly. So if there was any guidance, I would appreciate that. You know, what can I do about this habit of just sort of daydreaming about the past, I would call it? Okay, there's a few things here. Is, is one, it's important to understand that nothing on this path happens quickly. Oftentimes we have this expectation that just because we intellectually know that we need to cut off the thoughts and eliminate them, that we should be able to do that you know, immediately, where you need to have enough meditation and enough consistency in your meditation that you're able to let go of thoughts. So first thing is be sure you don't have an expectation that you should be able to immediately let go of these things, that it's going to be a gradual process. The other thing to talk about here is that there's a certain amount of healthiness to look back to the past and see things Mm -hmm. that we did in the past and how we handled them and what we did. And then reflecting on those things about if those same things happen today, how would we handle them differently based on what we know and the wisdom that we have? So if you're doing that kind of looking back to the past, then that's actually healthy for the mind because there might have been something five, 10 years ago or even a year or even a month ago that have that same thing happen again, you would handle it differently now with the Buddhist teachings and this helps you to gain wisdom. So if that kind of thing's going on and you're doing it when you're not driving, then that's really wonderful for the mind. But if you're finding that the mind is just daydreaming, as you say, and just kind of dwelling in the past, and it's kind of longing and yearning, either beating yourself up for certain things that happened or yearning and longing for pleasant things that happened in the past to be happening now, that's where when you observe it, even if it creeps up on you and next thing you know, you've been thinking about this for 10 minutes, wherever you notice it, just redirect the mind. You'd like to cut that off and let it go and just refocus Mm -hmm. on the driving, for example, since you're driving. And That might creep back into your mind in another 10 minutes or another five minutes. But where you see that, cut it off and let it go. You have to do that enough times over a consistent period of time in meditation and outside of meditation where the mind submits and it learns every time it goes over here and it tries to dwell in the past, you keep yanking it back. And eventually it'll stay in the present moment for longer and longer and longer. And it will no longer go to the past and dwell in the past. But there needs to just be long-term consistent training for it to kind of carve out this groove in the middle where it stays in this groove for longer and longer periods of time. And then when it bounces out of that groove, because this groove isn't yet deep enough, because you haven't been maybe working on it long enough, 
when it moves out of the middle, then you pull it back and you kind of get this groove in the middle deeper and deeper and deeper. And then eventually you've dug this groove in the middle so deeply that the mind can't actually pop out and move to the past or the future. You're still going to always remember the past. You're still going to maybe think about certain things that happened in the past. You might even plan for the future. You're going to do those things as part of uh, this path to enlightenment. But the key word that you're using there is dwelling. When the mind is dwelling in the past, either diminishing yourself or beating yourself up or wanting certain pleasurable things from the past to happen now, mm -hmm. that's what you'd like to cut off. But if you're just doing inner reflection in order to figure out some wisdom of how to handle that situation better, that's healthy. Or if you're looking to the future and planning things and trying to kind of organize things so that when you get to that point that you'll have thought through things and you'll be able to make better decisions in that moment, that's healthy for the mind too. But what you're not interested in doing is clinging to any decisions. So I'll use this example of this retreat that we've been working on for the last you know, eight or 10 months. There's certain things that I've been thinking about and planning and I know that I'm going to be doing as part of this retreat in the future that's going to happen in America in June 26th to the July 1st. I know that those things are going to happen and I've thought about certain things that I would like to share as part of the teachings and certain things I'd like to do as part of that retreat, but the mind isn't clinging or holding on to any of those things so that if they don't happen during the retreat or I just choose not to do it for one reason or another, depending on whatever variables are happening at the time, then the mind can just easily let that go. But had I not thought about this retreat at all and I just show up and be like, all right, I'm here, what do you guys want to learn? That wouldn't be the middle way either. So there needs to be not this complacency where you never think about the future, but there also needs to be not this craving and yearning where you're constantly thinking about the future and obsessed about it and then clinging to any decisions that you're making now for six months from now. But the middle way is I can think about the future. I can generally plan for the future and I'll have certain ideas, but I'm not tied to any one particular thing. And the same thing goes for the past, is that you can look to the past and you can make decisions about if that certain thing happened now, how would I handle it differently? And then where you see that the mind is doing any kind of longing or yearning or it's getting obsessed about these things, that's where you just cut it off and let it go and dig in this middle groove deeper and deeper so that the mind doesn't pop out and it has a tendency to stay in the middle for longer and longer periods of time. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Teacher David, I had a question regarding uh, the usage of the word evil in this translation in reference to having deeper concentration and a practitioner needing to gradually work towards improving the unwholesome conditions of the mind. Had I not read, had I read the statement um, omitting the word evil, I mean, I clearly can see that it is related to the unwholesome states, but with the inclusion of the word evil, can you elaborate if there was a direct translation that the what they used? Uh, and, and if so, then wouldn't that just be a condition that has arisen and it's therefore unwholesome? How is it identified as evil? So the way that a Buddha will sometimes speak is they'll speak in these exaggerated terms in order to help people grasp what it is that they're sharing. Because in the unenlightened state, we don't necessarily see something like central desire as evil, right? We're just like, oh, okay, well, you know, I would like to please this or please that. I have this central pleasure. And we just kind of chase after these things, thinking that that's just kind of normal life. But the Buddha is drawing this contrast to help you see that this is evil. It's unwholesome. Evil meaning it's dangerous for the mind. It's detrimental to the mind. It will erode any qualities of enlightenment. So while we've grown up pleasing the senses and while we've had many countless past lives where we're constantly pleasing the senses and having this sensual desire, the Buddha is drawing this contrast and showing you this danger, this difficulty and this struggle by using the word evil and calling it an evil unwholesome state. You know, same thing with ill will and complacency, because complacency is hindering us from being able to experience that enlightened mental state. And if you understood what enlightenment is fully, 
then you'll understand that anything the mind is experiencing in terms of pollution, it's hindering you from experiencing that. And that enlightened mental state is, as the Buddha says, beyond pleasure and pain. And anything that's hindering you from that, a Buddha might view it as evil because it's holding you back from being able to experience that peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy that is beyond pleasure and pain. But while we're stuck in the unenlightened state, constantly trying to please the senses through these impermanent conditions, we don't get to that beyond pleasure and pain because we're stuck in these evil, unwholesome states that the Buddha's describing. And he often will talk in exaggerated terms in order to draw this contrast and make it much clearer for people to be able to see it. Okay, understood. Thank you. You're welcome. We can go on to the next chapter, and we'll go to Miranda for that reading. By the way, as we're wrapping up that chapter, I would just like to point out in this particular chapter we just read, I created this chart to show you these unwholesome or these evil unwholesome qualities of mind that the Buddha is talking about. And then I made this other column, which shows you the exact antidote or how to remedy those. So as you observe these certain unwholesome qualities, then you can arise the wholesome quality to fix that. So be sure you look at that in the actual book because that's going to help you. So we'll go on from here. Excitement to be abandoned in all acts. Monks, if while he walks, such sensual or harmful or cruel thoughts arise, and he does not welcome them, but rejects, expels, makes an end of them, drives them out of renewed existence, a monk who while walking becomes one who is called dedicated, diligent, always and forever strong in energy and determined. If, while he stands such, sensual or harmful or cruel thoughts arise, and he does not welcome them, but rejects, expels, makes an end of them, drives them out of renewed existence, a monk who, while standing, becomes one, is called dedicated, diligent, always and forever strong in energy and determined. If, while he sits, such sensual or harmful or cruel thoughts arise, and he does not welcome them, but rejects, expels, makes an end of them, drives them out of renewed existence. A monk who, while sitting, becomes one, is called dedicated, diligent, always and forever strong in energy and determined. If, while he lies awake, such sensual or harmful or cruel thoughts arise, and he does not welcome them, but rejects, expels, makes an end of them, drives them out of renewed existence. A monk who, while lying awake, becomes one is called dedicated, diligent, always and forever strong in energy and determined. Okay, so thank you, Miranda. Here, the Buddha is essentially describing mindfulness and having awareness, even though he doesn't use that word in this particular excerpt. What he's really getting to is that while you're walking, while you're standing, while you're sitting, while you're lying, no matter what you're doing all waking hours there needs to be this mindfulness or this awareness of mind that as there's the central desire as there's any harmful or cruel thoughts that arise in the mind that you need to reject them expel them make an end to them drive them out so that they don't arise in the future so with that mindfulness or awareness of mind at all times during your day you can be aware whether you're in our case, maybe we're driving, which they didn't have that during the lifetime of the Buddha necessarily. Uh, while you're in a business meeting, while you're having a conversation with your partner and your children, while you're sitting by yourself, while you're doing any of these things in daily life, you need to be constantly aware of the mind that the work that we're doing to get to enlightenment isn't just in meditation. The meditation is training you to help you have that awareness of mind and that concentration and be able to easily let go of things. But you also need to do this work outside of meditation too, where you're just constantly aware of the mind and what's going on in the mind. And by making an effort to eliminate these unwholesome qualities of the mind, then the Buddha is saying, okay, you're dedicated, you're diligent, you're determined. Because if you didn't do that, then that's also complacency where the mind lacks this willingness to do something that a harmful thought comes into the mind and you just kind of let it permeate. 
and this is going to just continue to permeate in the mind. Or if a thought of sensual desire comes into the mind, if you just allow it to permeate in the mind, then it's going to be destructive to the mind. Or any kind of cruel thought, the Buddha is explaining all three of those here. So as soon as you're aware of those things starting to arise, the sooner you're aware of them, the sooner you cut them off, then they won't affect the condition of the mind. And over time, once again, you wear out this groove in the middle more and more and more where you won't have those thoughts arise at all. But in the process of getting to enlightenment, as the mind's transitioning, because of the fetters that are in the mind, particularly here he's talking about sensual desire and ill will, because those are in the mind, they are part of the ten fetters. The mind is polluted with sensual desire and ill will. There's going to be thoughts of sensual desire, harmful thoughts and cruel thoughts that arise occasionally. And as you observe those, the way that you get rid of them once and for all is as you observe them, you cut them off and let them go, no longer allowing them to come into the mind. But don't get frustrated if you have these thoughts because that just shows that the fetter of central desire and ill will is still there. It's in the mind. But the more you cut it off, each time it arises, eventually it realizes that it's not going to arise. It's just like a weed. Every time the weed grows, if you pluck the weed and pluck the weed and pluck the weed, because the roots are still there, the weed's going to keep growing back. But what you've got to eventually get to is as you cut off this weed more and more and more, you get down into the root and you uproot the weed so that it will no longer arise in the future. And that's what this whole path is doing for you. So the breathing mindfulness meditation is helping to uproot craving desire attachment so that when the mind's off the breath and it's longing, you're eliminating craving desire attachment. In loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness in daily life, you are uprooting the ill will so that the root is no longer there. But what the Buddha is talking about here is clipping back the weed that whenever you see the weed grow, you cut it off and cut it off and cut it off and cut it off. Let it go. Don't allow it to come into the mind. All the while, you're working on breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation to uproot the fetter of central desire and the fetter of ill will. And that's what's ultimately going to purify the mind when you eliminate all 10 fetters. And specifically those two relate to craving and anger so that you can uproot those unwholesome roots and now bring in the wholesome roots of generosity and loving kindness. And we practice this in daily life through our intentions, speech, and actions. But it's the meditations that really get that underway and then as you're doing that in your daily life, you're using mindfulness to be aware of any central, harmful, or cruel thoughts that arise, and you cut it off and cut it off and cut it off and cut it off until eventually you get this uprooted from the mind and that fetter is no longer there. Then these thoughts won't arise any longer. So being dedicated and diligent and determined to do this over a long-term consistent period is what's going to produce the results. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? There are no questions for this chapter. All right. So we'll move to chapter 23. We'll go to Jan. Thank you, Minal. The four efforts, first discourse. Monks, there are these four efforts. What for? The efforts to restrain, that to abandon, that to make arise, and the effort to preserve. And of what sort, monks, is the effort to restrain? Here, a monk generates intention for the non-arising of evil, unwholesome states that have not yet arisen. He makes an effort, applies his energy, he lays hold of and exerts his mind to this end. This monks is called the effort to restrain. And of what sort, monks, is the effort to abandon? Here, a monk generates intention for the abandoning of evil, unwholesome states that have arisen. He makes an effort, applies his energy, he lays hold of and exerts his mind to this end. This is called the effort to abandon. And of what sort, monks, is the effort to make arise? Here, he generates intention for the arising of wholesome states not yet arisen. He makes an effort, applies his energy, he lies hold of and exerts his mind to this end. This is called the effort to make arise. And of what sort, monks, is the effort to preserve? 
Here, a monk generates intention for the establishing, for the non-confusion, for the more existence, for the increase, cultivation, and fulfillment of wholesome states that have arisen. He makes an effort, applies his energy, he lays hold of and exerts his mind to this end. This is called the effort to preserve. So these monks are the four efforts. All right, thank you, Jan. So here the Buddha is talking about right effort from the Eightfold Path, but he's discussing it in a slightly different way than what he talks about it in the Eightfold Path. In the Eightfold Path, he describes it in this way, which is kind of a summary that I use, which is that first part of right effort is to prevent any unwholesome mental states that have not arisen from arising in the mind. That's the restraint that he's talking about there, is restraining the mind, not allowing these unwholesome mental states to arise. And then the second one is to abandon any unwholesome mental states that have already arisen in the mind. That's that abandoning that he's talking about in this particular discourse. And then there's the third aspect of right effort, which is produce unarisen wholesome mental states to arise in the mind. This is the part where he says make arise. And then maintain wholesome mental states that have arisen, not allowing them to fade away and work to increase their growth in the mind. This is where he talks about preserving. So here he's just describing the four efforts the right efforts in a different way because related back to the previous chapter where you understand that you need to be diligent and dedicated to watch over the mind with mindfulness at all times during your day then once you observe that there's these conditioned pleasant feelings painful feelings or feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant arising you need to apply right effort to abandon those or if you observe any unwholesome mental qualities you need to abandon those or if you observe wholesome qualities you need to support those encourage those and bring those into the mind whether it's generosity whether it's loving kindness or compassion or sympathetic joy or equanimity you need to bring these wholesome qualities and others into the mind through applying right effort and here he's just talking about it in a slightly different way so sometimes Discussing it in different ways can have you approach it from different angles and uh, can allow you to more deeply understand what something like right effort is. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It doesn't appear there are any questions for this chapter. All right, so let's move on to the next one, which is, again, talking about right effort here. Go to Miranda for the reading. Thank you, Mel. The four efforts. Second discourse. Monks, there are these four efforts. What for? The effort to restrain, the effort to abandon, the effort to make arise, and the effort to watch over. And of what sort, monks, is the effort to restrain? Here, having seen a form with the eye, a monk is not entranced and does not grasp its general features or its details. Since, if he left the eye faculty unrestrained, Evil, unwholesome states of craving and aversion might invade him. He practices restraint over it. He guards the eye sense base. He undertakes the restraint of the eye sense base. Having heard a sound with the ear, having smelled an odor with the nose, having tasted a flavor with the tongue, having touched a physical object with the body, having recognized a mental object with the mind, a monk is not entranced and does not grasp its general features or its details. Since, if he left the eye bay, some space unrestrained, evil, unwholesome states of craving and aversion might invade him. He practices restraint over it. He guards the eye sense space. He undertakes the restraint of the eye sense space, wins the restraint thereof. Similar discourses are spoken in the case of the ear sense space, the nose sense space, the tongue sense space, the body sense base, the mind sense base. This monks is called the effort to restrain. And of what sort monks is the effort to abandon? Here, a monk does not welcome sensual thought that has arisen. He is so also with regard to harmful and cruel thought that arisen. He does not welcome evil, unwholesome states that arise from time to time, but abandons it, expels it, makes an end of it. He drives them out of renewed existence. This monks is called the effort to abandon. And of what sort monks is the effort to make arise? 
Here, a monk makes to arise the limb of wisdom that is mindfulness, the limb of wisdom that is investigation of the teachings, the limb of wisdom that is energy, the limb of wisdom that is joy, the limb of wisdom that is tranquility, the limb of wisdom that is concentration, the limb of wisdom that is equanimity, that is based on seclusion, on freedom from strong feelings, on elimination that ends in surrender of the mind. This monks is called the effort to make arrives. And of what sort monks is the effort to watch over? Here, a monk watches over the favorable concentration mark, the idea of the skeleton, the idea of the worm-eaten corpse, of the discolored corpse, the cracked open corpse, the idea of the initiated corpse. This is called the effort to watch over. These then monks are the four efforts. All right, thank you, Miranda. So here, what the Buddha is doing is he's taking right effort and he's applying it to central desire. And he's walking you through step by step of how you apply right effort to eliminate the fetter of central desire. This first one, he's talking about restraining the mind, applying the effort to restrain the mind whenever there's certain contact through the six sense bases. So when you see a certain form with the eye, he talks about restraining the mind so that there's not this craving for agreeable contact and there's not this repulsion or this pushing away with aversion with disagreeable contact because that's what the mind's going to want to do. In the unenlightened state, the mind's longing and yearning for this agreeable contact through the six sense bases and that's where craving is going to take root and then the mind is going to keep longing and yearning for these same things to occur through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodily contact, and mind. It's longing and yearning for agreeable contact, and this is that craving for these pleasant feelings. And then when the mind experiences disagreeable contact, it's going to have this aversion, this pushing away, because the mind is uncomfortable with its own painful feelings, because when it longs and yearns and it gets the objects of its affection, it gets these pleasant feelings. But then when it doesn't get the objects of its affection, then that's when these painful feelings come into the mind, like anger, sadness, and others. And now the unalighted mind is going to have a tendency to push this away. This is where we push people out of our life or we push situations out of our life. This is aversion, thinking that this is going to actually solve the problem, but it really doesn't. Because what the real problem is, is the craving desire attachment. That's what's causing this aversion and this pushing away because there's this longing and yearning for pleasantness. And when the mind feels uncomfortable, painful feelings, the only way that an untrained mind knows how to solve that is to push it away. And it doesn't solve it long term. It's only a temporary solution. Because as you keep pushing situations and people out of your life, you can only do that so many times. And eventually you're quite lonely. You don't really have many people in your life. So what the Buddha is guiding you to do is to really focus on the core problem, which is the craving, desire, attachment. When you focus on the craving, desire, attachment, the longing and yearning for agreeable contact through the six sense spaces, then you won't have this aversion. So the mind can now reside in the middle. And that's this first part he's talking about is restraining the mind and pulling it back from longing and yearning for these pleasant feelings. And then he talks about abandoning that when these central thoughts arise and you feel the mind starting to move towards this pleasantness and wanting this pleasantness, that's where you cut that off and let that go. You abandon that because that's only going to lead to going into these painful feelings or these harmful and cruel thoughts that have arisen. Then he talks about the arising of these wholesome qualities of the seven factors of enlightenment. These seven factors of enlightenment are mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, tranquility, the concentration, and equanimity. You would need to focus on developing these and that helps to fine-tune the mind and bring it to the middle. And they solve a lot of the major difficulties that we encounter in the unenlightened state. So what he's encouraging you to do here is to arise the qualities of mindfulness or having awareness of mind, specifically practicing the four foundations of mindfulness, being aware of the bodily sensations, 
the feelings, the condition of the mind, and the mental objects so that you can cut off discontentedness and eliminate it there. And then arising the interest to investigate the teachings, arising the energy, arising the joy, the tranquility or calmness of mind, the concentration, being able to have a single focus, singleness of mind, and this equanimity, this evenness of temper, this calmness, this collectiveness, even in difficult situations. So by practicing the seven factors of enlightenment, and those are described in chapter three of volume one, and I may have even put them in here as well. Yes, I put them in this chapter as well that describes the seven factors of enlightenment in detail because you're going to need to arise those. The Buddha talks about using investigation, energy, and joy when the mind is sluggish, and that brings it to the middle. And then when the mind is excited to practice tranquility, concentration, and equanimity, that's what brings it to the middle. And he talks about always practicing mindfulness. But an enlightened being is going to be practicing all seven factors at all times. So as your mind's making its way to enlightenment, and you observe this sluggish condition, that's where you practice investigation, energy, and joy to bring it to the middle. And then the mind starts carving out this groove more and more. And then if you observe any excitedness, this conditioned excitement in the mind, that's where you bring in the tranquility, concentration, equanimity. And now more and more, the mind resides in that all the time. So an enlightened being is going to be practicing all seven factors at one time. And then he talks about here how the mind surrenders. That's what I was talking about earlier, how the mind submits, the more it longs and yearns and pulls in the direction of the objects of its affection, and you cut that off, and you uproot something like central desire, you uproot that, eventually the mind submits, or it surrenders, it gets into this groove in the middle, and it just stays there all the time, and then it won't pop out of the middle, but you'll get these longer and longer periods of time where it is in the middle, And then with mindfulness, you'll just observe when it's out of the middle and be able to pull it back. The way you'll know that the mind is in the middle is things will be at ease. The mind will be at ease. There'll be this peacefulness. The mind will feel content. It's almost like the mind takes this big breath, fresh air, and you just observe like, ah, this feels right. The mind's in the middle. Because when there's this longing and yearning, The mind's like, go, 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 go. It's pulling in the directions of the objects of its affection. But when the mind's complacent or sluggish, then the mind feels dull and lethargic. And that doesn't feel right either. It's only when the mind's perfectly tuned in the middle that it's like, ah, there's the peacefulness. There's the joy. That feels nice. And you get used to observing what that feels like more and more with mindfulness so that when the mind is out of that middle, You observe it quicker and quicker and can more easily pull it back. So where you observe the mind going to craving, yearning and longing, having this excitement, wanting these conditioned pleasant feelings, you observe that sooner and sooner and you can pull it back. And then when you observe the mind going to this complacency or this sluggish condition, you observe that sooner and sooner and you pull it back. Eventually, the mind surrenders and it stays in the middle all the time. And you'll experience these longer and longer periods and then it'll pop out. But then eventually, like I mentioned, you'll get into this groove where it'll just stay there for six months, a year, two years, three years. And that's where you'll know that you haven't experienced any discontentedness and the mind's enlightened at that point because it's now completely under your control. The mind surrendered. It submitted to you. And now you have complete discipline of this mind. And then this last one here, the watch over. In order to eliminate central desire, you need to get to the point where the mind is ultimately not having sexual intercourse any longer. And you may or may not be in that point of your life right now. But this is something that you will eventually need to get to as you decide to move into the fourth stage of enlightenment as an arahant. You can actually be in that first and second stage of enlightenment. There's still some central desire there. And somebody might work on all the other fetters and still be maintaining this sexual contact. But at some point, if you decide that you've done that enough and you're ready to move on, the Buddha has certain teachings that he helps you to be able to observe the unattractiveness of the body. Because central 
desires very deeply rooted in the unenlightened mind and sexual contact is one of the strongest central desires that we have because it involves oftentimes the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the bodily contact in the mind. All six senses are involved when we're engaged in sexual intercourse. So this tends to be one of the strongest central desires for some people and it's oftentimes for some people very difficult and challenging to overcome. And the reason why we have central desire and interested in having sexual contact with another human being or another being is that we view the physical body as being attractive. We don't see the body as it truly is. We see the hair made up. We see certain jewelry or clothing. We see maybe makeup. We see different things that the body has been decorated with, with this maybe perfume or cologne or other things like this. And the mind is enticed by this, seeing it as attractive. So one of the ways that the Buddha trains the mind and helps people to see the body as it truly is, is by seeing a dead corpse. And that's what he's describing here, is being able to see this skeleton or this worm-eaten corpse or this discolored corpse, this cracked open corpse. By viewing the body as it truly is, if somebody had their skin completely ripped off the body and they were still alive, which would be impossible, but if they were, and there was no skin whatsoever and all you saw was muscle tissue and bones and ligaments and fluids and organs, you most likely wouldn't be interested in having sexual intercourse with that. And you would be able to eliminate the central desire to ever have intercourse. But because we have this outer skin and we have these clothing and ways of making the body look more appealing, the central desire continues in the mind and we still have that strong desire to have sexual intercourse. So the way that you cut that off and eliminate it is work on all those other things the Buddha talked about in this discourse. But ultimately, when you're ready to let go of this central desire 100% and you're no longer interested in having sexual intercourse, then there's ways to actually meditate with the presence of an actual corpse or images and pictures we can use nowadays to actually replicate that. Where in the Buddha's lifetime, they didn't have this. So they would just go to the temple and before they were burning bodies for cremation, they would meditate around these bodies and they would meditate with their eyes open, looking at the bodies. And then they would also smell it too. So it kind of turned the mind away from being interested in having sex with this body. And that's one way to do it. But nowadays we have images and pictures that you can get a picture of a dead corpse and maybe the body dissected and opened up at the abdomen. And you can look at this and stare at this while you're meditating. And this can help turn the mind away from being interested in having sexual intercourse, thus getting rid of the fetter of sensual desire. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Looks like Miranda has her hand raised. Thank you, Manal. Yes, sir. That last part, what does the, that mean, the favorable concentration mark, sir? So this is where you focus your concentration on the idea of the skeleton, is that seeing this human being not as this meat and hair and clothing, but just see it as a skeleton. And then the same thing, focusing your concentration on a worm-eaten corpse. So rather than focusing necessarily on the breath during your meditation, you focus through the eyes on these different things that he's talking about. And you can get, like I mentioned, pictures. If you don't have a corpse available to you, even though there's some places that you can do that, you can go into anatomy labs and things like this. This is things that I did at different times where I went and actually observed a dead human being with the skin taken off and all you see is the flesh and bones and sinew, the eye sockets and the eyes and everything. And you can actually observe these things. Here in Thailand, there's places that you can go to temples and they will have dead corpses that you're able to meditate in the presence of dead corpses as they're burning. You can hear the sounds that the body makes. You can smell the body. So there's all these different ways. But for most people, I think that they'll probably end up using pictures or imagery, and that's your focus and your concentration rather than your breath necessarily. And then with doing this type of meditation, can that cause aversion to the human body? Is that something that should be guarded against, sir? 
Yeah, so you're going to watch over the mind that there's not this aversion to it, but you just understand that, yeah, the body has this pus and blood and urine and feces and, you know, all of this mucus and all these different things that are coming out of the body. We don't think about that when we're interested in sexual contact and we're engaging in sexual contact. But what the Buddha is helping you to do is to think about those things as part of his meditations. And he does this 32 part body meditation where you go through all the different parts of the body and you meditate on each individual part and you just develop this disinterest rather than an aversion. It's more of a disinterest in having sexual contact with another human body because you don't see it as something desirable any longer. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I had a question regarding the surrendering of the mind that is mentioned. I wanted to find out if there's I've heard in different religions, modern day religions, that there this sort of surrender word is used. I believe in Christianity, it's used, and in, in Hinduism, it's used as well, in reference to surrendering to God, basically, and surrendering yourself. Is the sentiment sort of laced with the same message if one has been raised with a teaching of surrender, would that be the same message which Buddha had referenced in this chapter, which you mentioned surrendering of the mind means submitting to the mind. Would that kind of be equal? It depends on how you've been exposed to it in the past. One of the ways to think about this is if I was going to replace this word surrender, I would say that ends in letting go of the mind, right? Where the mind lets go, where it fully lets go. That's what he's talking about in surrender or sometimes the word submit is used where you're not submitting to another being. You're not putting yourself below another being, but this letting go or this submitting is the mind choosing to let go of craving, desire, attachment. And that's what eliminates these strong feelings, this elimination, getting to the point where the mind is fully let go. That's what he's talking about here. So you're not surrendering to another being. You're not diminishing yourself. You're not putting yourself below another being. You're just training the mind to let go. Rather than longing and yearning through the sense spaces, you're just training it to surrender or submit or to let go, to no longer be chasing after these pleasurable feelings through impermanent conditions through these six sense bases. Would you agree that it has similar sort of net effect result if we had been raised previously believing that there's a surrender to God? Is there some similar kind of net effect which one can work on and then develop to understand that this is in fact the mind and submitting to the mind is more critical? You aren't submitting to the mind, but what he's talking about here is that the mind needs to submit and no longer hold on to the craving desire attachment so it's not that you are submitting to the mind it's that the mind is choosing to let go which i think is very different than surrendering to another being which is what you're talking about like surrendering to god or something like that here what the buddha is talking about is truly training the mind to let go having renunciation relinquishment no longer holding on, clinging, and craving through these six sense bases. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. There are no other questions for this chapter. All right. So we'll move on to the next one, which is chapter 25. We'll go to Jan for that reading. Thank you, Manal. The ending of the round. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not crave after it if it is pleasing. He is not averse to it if it is unpleasing. On hearing a sound with the ear, he does not crave after it if it is pleasing. He is not averse to it if it is unpleasing. On smelling an odor with the nose, he does not crave after it if it is pleasing. He is not averse to it if it is unpleasing. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, he does not crave after it if it is pleasing. He is not averse to it if it is unpleasing. On touching a physical object with the body, he does not crave after it if it is pleasing. He is not averse to it if it is unpleasing. 
On recognizing a mental object with the mind, he does not crave after it if it is pleasing. He is not averse to it if it is unpleasing. He resides with mindfulness of the body established with an immeasurable mind, and he understands as it actually is the liberation of the mind and liberation by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states are eliminated without remainder. Having thus abandoned favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he does not excitement in that feeling, welcome it, or remain holding to it. As he does not do so, excitement and feeling is eliminated in him. With the elimination of his excitement comes elimination of clinging. With the elimination of clinging, elimination of existence. With the elimination of existence, elimination of birth. With the elimination of birth, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair are eliminated. Such is the elimination of this whole mass of discontentedness. Okay, thank you, Jan. So here, the title of this is Ending of the Round. This is the round of the cycle of rebirth, because as long as there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind, that's the fuel that causes rebirth. So eliminating central desire is one of the strong, strong, strong cravings that the mind has. And by eliminating this central desire, you're going to eliminate this continuous round of rebirth being reborn over and over and over again. And the Buddha kind of brings in a little bit of dependent origination here towards the end, which dependent origination is 12 steps where he explains how the mind experiences discontentedness and how it continues to be reborn over and over and over again. So by eliminating central desire, that's what's going to help you eliminate discontentedness, getting to enlightenment, but it's also going to help you end the cycle of rebirth as well. What he's talking about here with related to each one of the individual sense bases is that you don't crave after things that are pleasing, but you're not averse to things that are unpleasing, where the mind's in the middle. Uh, Let me use an example here of this odor. So if you're walking down the street and you're smelling these flowers, you know, the wind's blowing and you're smelling these flowers, it's like, oh, wow, that's a really nice smell. And you observe that. It's like, wow, that's a nice smell. But then you walk a little bit further and the smell of the sewer comes up into the mind. And now you're like, hmm, that's an odor that is kind of unpleasing. But your mind is content during both of those situations. The mind isn't craving the pleasant feeling and it's not averse to the unpleasing odor. Where if you've ever been walking down the street and you're like, oh my goodness, that just smells amazing. Do you smell that fresh baked bread coming out of that bakery? Oh, if I could just get my hands on a loaf of bread from that place, right? That's craving. Or the other example is if you're walking down the street and you smell that sewer smell and you're like, oh my goodness, that is the most horrible smell, right? The mind is doing that and you might vocalize it or you may not. You may not vocalize it. It may just be happening in the mind. So what the Buddha is explaining here is the middle way is you're not craving the pleasant and you're not averse to the unpleasant, that you just see these things as impermanent conditions and you're not interested in either side of that. And that's where he gets down here, where he talks about mindfulness established of the body. So when you have this mindfulness of the bodily sensations, this is the four foundations of mindfulness, then whenever the mind is longing and craving for pleasant things, you'll observe the bodily sensations and you cut that off and let it go. So you're not holding on and welcoming. You're rejecting that feeling to arise in the mind. And then same thing if you notice that the mind is experiencing these disagreeable contact or this unpleasing contact that you observe the bodily sensations of the discontentedness that is arising and you cut that off and let that go not allowing that to come into the mind and what you eventually get to is what the buddha is talking about here is where the mind actually abandons this favoring and opposing where right now you might see things as agreeable contact and disagreeable contact When you train the mind enough in breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity, and when you train the mind enough where when you see these pleasant things arising, you cut it off, and when you see these 
unpleasing things arising, you cut that off. Eventually, you get to the point where you don't see things as pleasing or unpleasing or agreeable or disagreeable, but instead it's just an impermanent thing that's happening and you're not interested in either side of it. And that's what he's saying here, that that the mind will have eventually abandoned favoring and opposing or agreeable and disagreeable or craving and aversion. The mind will abandon those in whatever he feels that you won't feel this agreeable and disagreeable. It's just something that's happening. So if you hear music that the mind enjoys, it's like, okay, well, I enjoy this. And yeah, it's a nice music, but I'm not longing or yearning for it to continue. But then when you hear some other music that maybe isn't something that you would normally listen to, that you just see it as something that you wouldn't normally listen to, but you're not opposed to it. You don't have this aversion. You don't have this repulsion towards it. Because there, when there's this agreeable and disagreeable, or this pleasing or unpleasing, or this affection or this repulsion towards certain things, then the mind's still shaken up to a certain degree. Even if it's not overtly being shown through your speech and your actions, the mind internally is still displeased with the situation because it still has this agreeable and disagreeable in the mind. So you would like to even fade that away from the mind where you don't see things as agreeable or disagreeable, but it, but it's just what is. This person's playing music, it's just what is. Today when I was teaching at the temple and we were doing meditation and I started meditating, we had the windows at the temple open and the breeze was blowing and there happened to be some construction work right outside the temple. So there was somebody banging a hammer for you know maybe three to five minutes while we were doing meditation. But rather than seeing this as disagreeable, like, oh, I don't want this hammer to be banging while we're doing meditation. Instead, just view it for what it is, is that there's this impermanent sound that has started and it's going to end. And we can just remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy regardless because we don't see this as a disagreeable thing. It's just something that's happening. It's an impermanent condition. And then that's where the mind then becomes liberated because it's no longer clinging. It's no longer looking for this excited condition. It's no longer looking for these pleasant feelings. And it's no longer clinging and wanting these temporary excitement, this temporary pleasant feelings. And when you eliminate that craving, desire, attachment, this clinging, you no longer have this opposing or favoring, you no longer have this agreeable or disagreeable, then the mind can come into its own and it can just be content where there's silence and you're meditating, you're completely fine with that. But when someone starts banging a hammer, you can be completely fine with that too because you know it's an impermanent situation and it's just a matter of time before that's over. There's no need to allow the mind to become discontent in that situation. And where you observe that the mind is becoming discontent in that situation, you restrain it, you pull it back, and you gain more control over it by cutting it off and letting it go. And as you do this more and more readily in all parts of your life, then that's where the mind is able to stay in that middle all the time and all discontentedness will be eliminated because there's no more conditions of craving, desire, attachment where the mind wants this agreeable contact. So therefore, there's no longer any agreeable or disagreeable contact that the mind is longing or yearning for or that it's opposed to or has aversion towards. And now the mind can just always remain content because it no longer has this agreeable and disagreeable or pleasing or unpleasing. It's just a situation that's occurring and it's only a matter of time before that's over. So if it's something that the mind enjoys, no need to cling to it because it's going to be over soon. And if I cling to it, it's just going to cause discontentedness. If it's something that the mind would prefer not to happen, there's no reason to be averse to it because it's going to be over soon anyway. So just let it go and allow it to take its course. And then when it's over, it's over. And now the mind can just remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy through all of that. So that's what he's talking about here is getting you to the point that you understand that you need to abandon this favoring and opposing or this agreeable and disagreeable contact. That's what's going to ultimately help you to eliminate sensual desire. What questions do you guys have here? Amina has a question on Zoom. 
is there a distinction that can be made between looking forward to eating a certain dish like waffles on the weekend versus craving sugary flavors on constant basis? I don't tend to think about looking forward to something. Occasionally, I've started saying to somebody, I think I wrote an email recently of, I said, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the retreat or something like that. But in reality, if that person didn't show up to the retreat, you know, I wouldn't be discontent. It was just like interested to see you at the retreat is kind of what I'm saying. So when we kind of look forward to something, this is almost an indication that the mind is craving or clinging because it's looking forward to it. It really wants that to occur. But there's the ability for the mind to know that, oh, I would like to have those waffles this weekend. And yeah, that's something that I'll do this weekend. And then just kind of know that that's going to happen. But then if you wake up in the morning and the machine that you use to make the waffles isn't working, then if you weren't looking forward to it, you were just had an interest or a goal that you were going to eat waffles. Then when the machine isn't working, your mind's not shaken up by it. It's like, oh, okay, the machine's not working. No waffles today. Let's go on to something else and get something else rather than just kind of dwell there and be discontent that you can't get a waffle. So you've got to observe the mind if you're looking forward to something, is there really truly craving desire attachment there? And then if you don't get that something, now the mind's going to be discontent. Or if you get that something, is the mind taking these you know pleasurable feelings in it? So one of the things that I enjoy eating here in Thailand is something called Nam Prik Ong. This is like tomatoes and herbs and all these different things. I think of it, if you've ever in America eaten Manwich or Hamburger Helper, it's not using meat that I eat it with, although they make it with meat. I eat it in a vegan variety. And it's not a canned thing. It's using fresh herbs, but it has that kind of flavor to it. And you eat it over rice. I enjoy eating this. And there's this one particular restaurant that makes it really well. So I will ask my wife occasionally if she can call that restaurant and see if they'll make it for me because it's one of those restaurants that they have a set menu. They decide what they're going to cook each day. And then if you go to that restaurant, you just eat what they cook. But sometimes they'll take a special request. So about once every two weeks, once a month, I will ask my wife, you know, can you call them and see if they'll make that for me? And then sometimes they're like, no, you know, we're not going to make that for another week or we're not going to make that for two weeks or we can't make that until Friday. And it's like, all right, well, I can't wait until then. Whereas if the mind was looking forward to it and longing and yearning and wanting them to make it right away, then the mind's going to be discontent in that situation where they say, you know, we can't make it for another week or two. They don't have the supplies. So if you're looking forward to something, just have mindfulness to observe. Are there conditioned pleasant feelings that arise when you get that something? And if you can't get that something, is there this, you know, frustration or annoyance or ickiness or just feeling like your day's not complete without that thing? And in that situation, I would encourage you to adjust your vocabulary and your phrasing of words and maybe not say that you're looking forward to it but maybe just say something like oh i would like to have some waffles this weekend or are you guys interested in having waffles this weekend right that's one of the ways you can kind of change the way that you speak and then the mind will change the way that it relates to this waffle or any other kind of thing that you're taking in through the senses She asks also, is it okay to look forward to eating a certain food for a brief moment as long as the mind does not dwell on that thought? So I don't think about whether it's okay, right? It's more about what the mind's doing because you can do whatever you like to do. The only thing you have to do in this world is die. That's the only thing. Everything else is optional. So you can practice however you choose to practice. But for me, like when I know that that food, that Nam Prik Ong is available, it's like, okay, great. You know, I'll get a chance to eat that food. That's fine. But then when that food's not available, then there's other foods that I'll eat too. And there's certain foods that are tasting really great, but there's also certain foods that don't taste so great. It's just kind of like bland or just kind of marginal food that I'm going to still eat because I see this food as nourishing the body, not to please the tongue and please the mind. If you're looking forward to certain foods 
and you're doing that in order to please the tongue and please the mind, that's what central desire is. So this is where what I suggest for people to do with food is have other people order your food for you occasionally, particularly when you go out to restaurants or if there's other people around, you just see them order something. You're like, all right, I'll take that. Don't allow the mind to make choices about foods for an extended period of time because the mind's going to try to convince itself that it doesn't have certain cravings. And the only way that you can determine whether there's cravings there or not is to not give the mind what it wants. So if the mind wants this piece of chocolate cake really bad and you can feel that or even you're not even quite sure whether it's a craving or not, but you're just kind of looked at the menu you're like, all right, I'm going to get that chocolate cake. Instead, switch it up and be like, you know what? I'm not going to get that chocolate cake. Let me see how the mind deals with that. So even when you have that thought of, I would like to have this spaghetti, or I would like to have that nonprik ong, or I would like to have these waffles. When you say that out loud, then actually that weekend don't have the waffles and see how the mind reacts or how it functions when you don't get those waffles. So the only way that you'll know if the mind's attached to the waffles or not is if you introduce some impermanence. If you keep giving the body and the mind, the tongue, these waffles, then you'll never know whether or not it's actually craving or attached to them. So where you observe that the mind is looking forward to them, then choose not to eat them for a couple of weekends and see how the mind feels about that. Because if the mind doesn't have sensual desire, it should be just as content eating one thing versus another. And you should be able to go an extended period of time without eating the waffles and be just completely content with it without any kind of longing or yearning for them. And she has a follow-up. So think of it as an interest only. Right, that you have an interest in this. But also, you know, if you have an interest in eating waffles and you eat them every single weekend, then maybe your mind is speaking interest because you know that's kind of like the right answer. But deep inside, the mind still has this craving. So the only way for you to discern whether or not it's truly craving or whether you're just using the right words because your teacher told you what those words are, instead, introduce some impermanence in the situation that where you observe that the mind is having this interest in eating waffles, then go two or three or four weekends without eating them and see how the mind deals with that. And that's the only way that you're going to know whether there's a real craving there or not. And if you observe that the mind is longing and yearning for these waffles, then you have to go extended periods of time without them until it finally releases this craving. And then eventually you can decide to eat the waffles again, but you do that as an interest rather than as a craving. But you have to be sure the mind fully releases it and it's no longer yearning and longing for those waffles. It looks like Jan has her hand raised. Thank you, Manal. Teacher David, I, I wonder if you could help me think through a situation. I don't feel particularly that I'm craving anything right now, but I am very aware my husband's birthday is coming up and he's made plans and if the plans don't work out the way that he's hoping that he will be quite upset and so any advice for just negotiating you know when a family member or somebody in your household is having these kind of cravings that things will be a certain way and then they're upset and disappointed when they're not getting what they want Yeah, for you, you just have to understand that when they're disappointed or discontent that you didn't cause that. Even if it was that they made plans with you and you weren't able to show up or you were involved somehow, if they become disappointed or discontent or disgruntled even, you didn't cause it. There was obviously some impermanence that happened that you weren't able to maybe show up to the event and you just apologize for that and you say sorry. And at the same time, they're probably practicing wrong view and they might think that you're the one who's causing them to be angry in that situation. If they're not on this path and they're not understanding right view, then you know, you're gonna encounter people who are gonna be blameful to us and think that we're the ones that are causing their discontentedness. But as long as you know the truth and you know that that's not what's occurring, then you can still reside content and peaceful in those situations. And just perhaps let them know, particularly your husband, the Buddha talks about when there's people in our life that we're close with and we have this deep compassion for them, 
that we can try to establish them in understanding the Four Noble Truths. And there's ways to do that without talking about Buddhism or things like this and helping them see that the only thing that's happened here, husband, is that there's been some impermanence. I had every intention of coming. As I explained, you know, we made the plans, we made the date, I was planning to come, but I got a flat tire. I just wasn't able to come. The thing that's actually causing your mind to be angry or frustrated is your mind wanted me to come so badly. But I would have been there had it not been for this impermanence. And sometimes when their mind is actually discontent, that's one of the best times to help them see the Four Noble Truths, that they can then have a a real example, a real tangible example for them to see it. This is how I helped Bailan, my son, to understand the Four Noble Truths is when his toys were broke, I would get down on the floor with him and as he was crying and I would talk to him about craving and how his mind was yearning and longing for these toys to be permanent. And because they're not, that's what's causing him to cry, not the broken toy itself. So you can potentially try to talk with somebody who's close to you like that, but they may or may not be interested depending on what's going on. But as long as you know that you're not causing the discontent in this because it's impossible for you to cause somebody else to be discontent. But we can still be apologetic and say sorry, but obviously impermanence in a lot of cases is just out of our control. It's just impermanence and we try to make the best decisions we can, but impermanence is still going to happen. And this is a real learning experience for that individual, that they're not going to be able to get everything their way all the time. And another thing you can do is you can kind of get ahead of the curve where you see that his mind is this way and he's talking about all these plans and all these things that are going to happen and he really wants this to happen. You can say, and I don't know what you call your husband, I'll just use the word honey, you know, honey, while these plans sound absolutely wonderful and I'm really interested to participate, I would like you to understand that it's highly unlikely that everything's going to happen exactly the way you have it in your mind. Do you realize that? Do you understand that? That what you have in your mind versus what's going to happen are probably two completely different things. And then you kind of talk about that a little bit and then maybe help him understand impermanence and craving and yearning and maybe help him see that maybe he can have some goals or some objectives and ways that he would like this to unfold, but help him to see that it's not going to necessarily unfold exactly the way he is intending it to unfold. And then this is the way to kind of get ahead of the curve a bit. But still, he can still get upset during the impermanence that happens that this doesn't occur the way that he would like it to occur. But if you do this over multiple situations because you're living close with him, then he can gradually start to see that it's his own craving, desire, attachment that's causing the discontentedness. And you can kind of get ahead of the curve a little bit. And But until somebody truly gets on the path and they're doing things like breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity and doing the Eightfold Path and all the other teachings, they're not going to be able to eliminate discontentedness until they get firmly on the path. But you can kind of help ease the troubles that people experience if they're open to talking to you and you can discuss these things with them on a person-to-person basis, particularly people that we live with because those tend to be people that are more open to talking with us and understanding a bit of what's going on in their mind. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Go to Miranda next. I came out kind of the opposite of when you were answering Amina's question. If a practitioner does find they have an aversion to something, would it be wise for them to then try to confront that thing that they have the aversion to repeatedly while each time trying to cut off bodily sensations, mental thoughts about being averse to whatever it is that they have the aversion to? In some situations, yes, that's exactly how to train the mind to not be averse to it, is put the mind in that situation. But there are some situations where it doesn't make sense to do that. So, for example, if you happen to be in a relationship where there's like a lot of harshness and aggressiveness and things like this, and you guys have decided to no longer be in a relationship together, and maybe you're averse to that person or to that situation, it doesn't make sense to go back into that situation and train the mind to now be content in that situation because there's just a lot of things that are out of your control in that situation. But in a situation where 
like I used an example, I think last class talking about durian, this fruit that tastes like, in my view, it smells like poop. It has the consistency of poop. Not that I've ever had poop in my mouth, but to me, I've always viewed durian that way. So in this situation, my wife heard me talking about that and we like to test our mind. We like to challenge our mind. So she happened to go out and buy that a few days later. And she came over and asked me, would you like some? And she put it in my mouth. And I realized that I actually didn't have an aversion to it. But that's the only way that you'll know that you have eliminated any aversion, which means you've eliminated the craving for central desire, is to put your mind in that situation. So if there's things like that, like foods or certain things like that, then yeah, that's the way you do it is you confront it and put the mind in that situation and train the mind to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy in that situation. But there's some situations where you might have aversion to somebody because of some hostility that's occurred. And you can instead work on that in your loving kindness meditation rather than actually going back to actually be with that person necessarily. So if you had other examples that you were thinking of, Miranda, you can share those, but these are just a couple of examples that I was thinking of. The thought in the mind was more of like an odor or a sight or a sound, sir. So I think that's been covered. Yeah, those are really good ones. Like say your car got into a car accident and your mind was just shaken up by seeing this brand new car that you bought and it's all crushed and you just couldn't look at it. You're like, I don't even want to look at that car. It just drives me crazy looking at the car. I can't believe I got an accident. In that situation, you can go out and you can sit there and you can look at the car and just train the mind to be content with it and do that over two or three times until the mind's just like, all right, well, it's impermanent. I'll get it fixed. No big deal. Right. So you can confront the aversion in these situations and train the mind to just accept the impermanence because that's what it doesn't like is it doesn't like the impermanence and you've got to sometimes visually see something or hear or smell or taste or come in contact with a certain physical object or have certain mental objects where the mind is training to no longer have this craving or this aversion to it and by putting the mind in that situation that's what will help you to accomplish that and then you can have the confidence yourself that you've eliminated that craving desire attachment and there's no longer this aversion so when i ate that durian a couple of weeks ago i was like oh nice i've tested the mind and yeah the mind doesn't have an aversion to this as it did many years ago the first times i came in contact with it and that can give you confidence to see that the mind is more and more liberated. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. There are no other questions for this chapter. All right, so we'll move on to chapter 26. And we'll go to Miranda for the reading. Thank you, Manal. Mindfulness directed to the body, a strong post for mind. One dwells without having set up mindfulness of the body. Suppose, monks, a man would catch six animals with different domains and different feeding grounds, and tie them by a strong rope. He would catch a snake, a crocodile, a bird, a dog, a jackal, and a monkey, and tie each by a strong rope. Having done so, he would tie the ropes together with a knot in the middle and release them. Then, those six animals with different domains and different feeding grounds would each pull in the direction of its own feeding ground and domain. The snake would pull one way, thinking, let me enter an anthill. The crocodile would pull another way, thinking, let me enter the water. The bird would pull another way, thinking, let me fly up into the sky. The dog would pull another way, thinking, let me enter a village. The jackal would pull another way, thinking, let me enter a charnel ground. The monkey would pull another way, thinking, let me enter a forest. Now, when these six animals become worn out and fatigued, They would be dominated by the one among them that was the strongest. They would submit to it and come under its control. So too, monks, when a monk has not developed and cultivated mindfulness directed to the body, the eye pulls in the direction of agreeable forms and disagreeable forms are repulsive. The ear pulls in the direction of agreeable sounds and disagreeable sounds are repulsive. The nose pulls in the direction of agreeable odors and disagreeable odors are repulsive. The tongue pulls in the direction of agreeable flavors, and disagreeable flavors are repulsive. The body pulls in the direction of agreeable physical objects, and disagreeable physical objects are repulsive. 
The mind pulls in the direction of agreeable mental objects, and disagreeable mental objects are repulsive. It is in such a way that there is non-restraint. One resides having set up mindfulness of the body. Suppose, monks, a man would catch six animals with, a, with different domains and different feeding grounds and tie them by a strong rope. He would catch a snake, a crocodile, a bird, a dog, a jackal, and a monkey, and tie each by a strong rope. Having done so, he would bind them to a strong post or pillar. Then, those six animals with different domains and different feeding grounds would each pull in the direction of its own feeding ground and domain. The snake would pull one way, thinking, let me enter an anthill. The crocodile would pull another way, thinking, let me enter the water. The bird would pull another way, thinking, let me fly up into the sky. The dog would pull another way, thinking, let me enter a village. The jackal would pull another way, thinking, let me enter a charnel ground. The monkey would pull another way, thinking, let me enter a forest. Now, when these six animals become worn out and fatigued, they would stand close to that post or pillar. They would sit down there. They would lie down there. So too, monks, when a monk has developed and cultivated mindfulness directed to the body, the eye does not pull in the direction of agreeable forms, nor are disagreeable forms repulsive. The ear does not pull in the direction of agreeable sounds, nor are disagreeable sounds repulsive. The nose does not pull in the direction of agreeable odors, nor are disagreeable odors repulsive. The tongue does not pull in the direction of agreeable flavors, nor are disagreeable flavors repulsive. The body does not pull in the direction of agreeable physical objects, nor are disagreeable physical objects repulsive. The mind does not pull in the direction of agreeable mental objects, nor are disagreeable mental objects repulsive. It is in such a way that there is restraint. A strong poster pillar, this monks, is a designation for mindfulness directed to the body. Therefore, monks, you should train yourselves thus. We will develop and cultivate mindfulness directed to the body, make it our vehicle, make it our basis, stabilize it, exercise ourselves in it, and fully perfect it. Thus should you train yourselves. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here the Buddha is talking about the importance and the difference of not having this mindfulness directed to the body. And what mindfulness directed to the body is, is having awareness of those bodily sensations that we talk about as part of the four foundations of mindfulness. And you're cultivating this awareness of the bodily sensations in meditation, but then you're practicing it in daily life that you observe when discontentedness is arising, there's these bodily sensations. And when you have awareness of those bodily sensations, you're gaining restraint and control over the mind. But when you don't have that, you don't have this restraint. And he talks about this first aspect of if you don't have restraint, you don't have awareness of these bodily sensations. It's like tying six animals to a rope and they're all tied to each other in the middle and they're all going to pull in different directions. And when all the other five get tired, there'll be one particular animal that everyone kind of gets pulled by that one particular one. And what he's talking about is the six sense bases that the mind as it longs and yearns through these six sense bases, if there's no awareness of the bodily sensations that are a rising discontentedness and you cut that off and let it go, when you don't have that, then there's going to be at least one particular sense base that is going to be dominant and it's going to pull and it's going to still have craving, desire, attachment, and you're going to experience discontentedness. But when you develop this restraint over the mind, it's like instead of tying all these animals in a knot and they all pull each other, instead when you have this mindfulness directed to the body and you're aware of the bodily sensations, it's like having this post or this pillar and you've tied all the animals to the post and pillar. And then as they pull in all their different directions, they keep coming back to that post and pillar, keep coming back to the post and pillar. And eventually they get tired and they essentially submit and they sit right there by that post and pillar. So your breath and meditation is the post and pillar that allows you to develop the awareness of these bodily sensations. And then in daily life, these bodily sensations, when you observe them with conditioned pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant, you cut them off and let them go so that the mind can now no longer be longing and yearning through the sense spaces, but it keeps getting pulled back to this middle way. 
And you do that by having awareness of the bodily sensations and cut that off and let it go. And here you see that he talks about how when these six animals are worn out, they would lie down there. This is the mind submitting and just choosing to no longer long and yearn. So that when you observe the bodily sensations, when you cut it off and let it go over multiple times, over many months, then eventually the mind will just give in and it will no longer long and yearn through these sense bases and the mind will just be perfectly in the middle. And that's where the mind is liberated. And it's this breathing mindfulness meditation that's going to help you to get to that point because you're going to be developing awareness of the four foundations of mindfulness. And then it's being active and dedicated and diligent in your practice that when you observe bodily sensations associated with discontentedness arising, you cut that off and let it go. And that's why the Buddha says, okay, you need to fully perfect this as part of your training. If you don't perfect this part of your practice, you won't get to enlightenment. But conversely, the Buddha also says somebody who's aware of the bodily sensations when discontentedness is starting to arise and you can cut it off and let it go there, he says this person is very near to enlightenment. Because when you're able to observe that very clearly, and you've trained the mind to the point where you can easily let it go, when you see those bodily sensations, this person is getting near and near to enlightenment because you're gaining more control and more restraint over the mind. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It doesn't appear that there are any questions for this chapter. All right, so we'll move on to the next one. The simile of the tortoise. Monks, in the past, a tortoise was searching for food along the bank of a river one evening. On that same evening, a jackal was also searching for food along the bank of the same river. When the tortoise saw the jackal in the distance searching for food, it drew its limb and neck inside its shell and passed the time keeping still and silent. The jackal had also seen the tortoise in the distance searching for food, so he approached and waited close by, thinking, when this tortoise extends one or another of its limbs or its neck, I will grab it right on the spot, pull it out, and eat it. But because the tortoise did not extend any of its limb or its neck, the jackal, failing to gain access to it, lost interest in it and departed. So two monks, Mara, the evil one, is constantly and continually waiting close by you, thinking, Perhaps I will gain access to him through the eye, through the ear, or through the nose, or through the tongue, or through the body, or through the mind. Therefore, monks, reside guarding the doors of the six sense spaces. Having seen a form with the eye, having heard a sound with the ear, having smelt an odor with the nose, having tasted a flavor with the tongue, having touched a physical object with the body, having recognized a mental object with the mind, do not grasp its signs and features. Since if you leave the eye sense base unguarded, the ear sense base unguarded, the nose sense unguarded, the tongue sense unguarded, the body sense unguarded, the mind sense base unguarded, evil unwholesome states of craving and displeasure might invade you. Practice the way of its restraint, guard the eye sense base, the ear sense base, the nose sense base, the tongue sense base, the body sense base, the mind sense base, Undertake the restraint of the eye sense space and ear sense space, the nose sense space, the tongue sense space, the body sense space, and the mind sense space. When monks you reside guarding the doors of the six sense spaces, Mara, the evil one failing to gain access to you, will lose interest in you and depart just as the jackal departed from the tortoise. Drawing in the mind's thoughts as the tortoise draws in its limbs into the shell, independent, non-harassing others, fully extinguished a monk would not blame anyone all right thank you manal this is a simile that we've covered in other books and if you're reading this book you would have read the explanation is there any questions on this particular chapter that you guys have teacher david just a clarifying question would right mindfulness be pertaining to the sixth sense basis whereas right concentration is pertaining to more of the fetters, the taints, or pollution. So right mindfulness is the guard of the six sense bases. So when you have awareness of mind, that's the guard that you're guarding the six sense bases. And then what the concentration is, is that's the byproduct of eliminating something like central desire from the mind. Then the mind's going to experience this concentration. 
And of course, there's that practicing singleness of mind as part of right concentration as well. So the mindfulness, think of it as the guard, the way to guard the mind, being aware of the mind, any unwholesome states that arise, you can then apply right effort and cut that off. Any wholesome mental states that you observe through right mindfulness, you can arise those, cultivate them, don't allow them to fade. And then by doing this and practicing singleness of mind, then you will experience right concentration, the more and more pollution that you eliminate from the mind. Understood. Doesn't appear there are any questions for this chapter? All right. So let's look at chapter 28. We'll go to Jan for the reading. Thank you, Manal. Sense control leads to liberating wisdom and insight. Monks, imagine a tree with thriving branches and leaves. Its buds, bark, sapwood, and heart come to maturity. Even so, monks, when sense control exists, virtue, moral conduct, naturally thrives in him, thriving in sense control. When there is virtue, concentration naturally thrives in him. When concentration, true wisdom and insight. When true wisdom and insight, abandoning and freedom from strong feelings. When abandoning and freedom from strong feelings, liberating wisdom and insight naturally thrive in him. All right. Thank you, Jan. This is actually what Manal was just asking a question about and what I had answered is that when there's control of the senses, right, when you're able to restrain the senses and ultimately eliminate central desire, then this is where there's virtuous moral conduct. Because as long as the mind has longing and yearning, this craving through the six sense bases, then our decisions about our moral conduct are going to be polluted because there's this craving desire attachment. So when there's elimination or when there's control of the sense bases, you have this moral conduct. And then with that moral conduct, then there's this concentration that comes into the mind as a byproduct. Because if our mind is constantly craving and yearning, trying to have these selfish desires, pleasing the senses, then we have this corrupt moral conduct that we're being unwholesome, then our mind can't be at ease and it can't have this concentration. So that concentration comes into the mind, the more that we restrain the senses, the better moral conduct we have, therefore, the better concentration we have, because we know we're not causing harm to anybody in the world. We're not making decisions based on our own selfish desires, because you've eliminated those selfish desires, that you're not interested in just pleasing the senses. And this is where he then says, okay, when there's concentration, now this is where you get to that wisdom or insight. The way that I explain this is I say, when there's calmness in the mind, then you can have mindfulness or awareness of mind. Then you can experience this concentration or singleness of mind. And then by having that, you have access to wisdom and you can make wise decisions. Where conversely, when the mind is uncalm and shaken up, you can't have awareness of the mind. And then you don't have concentration. Therefore, you can't access wisdom. So this is why when you're in a certain difficult situation, if you're not practicing equanimity and the mind shaken up, you might actually make decisions in that difficult situation that makes the situation worse. But by maintaining your calmness, you can maintain your mindfulness, maintain your concentration and there you can access wisdom in this difficult situation the equanimity or this evenness of temper this calmness this composure is allowing you to make wiser and wiser decisions about whatever it is that you're facing as a challenge and now you're ensuring that you're making decisions that aren't producing more unwholesome results because everything on this path is all about getting to wisdom because it's ignorance or the unknowing of true reality that is causing the mind to be discontent and continuous through this cycle of rebirth. So when you get to wisdom and you're making wise decisions and putting those out into the world, then wholesome things are going to be coming back to you. You'll keep experiencing more and more wholesomeness. So if you allow your mind to be uncalm, not have mindfulness, not have concentration, and you don't have access to wisdom, you're gonna be making more and more unwise decisions. So you need to cultivate this calmness or this equanimity, this tranquility in the mind where the mind is relaxed and calm, but yet attentive and alert. 
relaxed and calm, yet attentive and alert. That's what the enlightened mind is going to experience. So with this equanimity and tranquility, now you have mindfulness, concentration, access, wisdom. Every decision you're making is based in wisdom and you're experiencing the results of your wise decisions through wholesome outcomes. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Miranda has her hand raised. Thank you, Manal. Just a little question just for clarification. It says when true wisdom and insight here and then the next line down talks about liberating wisdom and insight, is that the same thing and he was just using different wording or those two different types of wisdom, sir? It's still wisdom, but it's a matter of cultivating enough wisdom that you liberate the mind because ignorance is that top part of dependent origination and wisdom is what unravels dependent origination and gets you to enlightenment so when there's true wisdom and insight this is just okay you're exercising essentially your wisdom and insight which helps you to get to abandoning of strong feelings and then as you've done that enough and repeatedly over and over and over where the feelings are diminishing in terms of discontentedness then with the abandoning of the strong feelings, then the mind has been liberated by wisdom. That the mind has gotten to the point where you've accomplished what the Buddha calls final knowledge. That you fully understand this path because the mind is now fully liberated. Where when you're in the process of getting to enlightenment, you're going to have true wisdom. But it's not liberating wisdom yet because the mind isn't yet fully liberated. So it's still wisdom, but it's just a matter of whether the mind's liberated or unliberated. Because as long as the slight little sliver of central desire or a slight little sliver of conceit or arrogance or pride or any of these other fetters, then the mind hasn't yet been liberated by wisdom because there's still ignorance in the mind. So it's a matter of kind of being in the process of doing that and using the wisdom to do that versus actually having accomplished that 100% through getting to the point where you've accomplished final knowledge and now the mind is completely liberated by wisdom. Okay, thank you. Thank Mm -hmm. you, sir. You're welcome. There are no other uh, questions for this chapter. All right, so we'll go to 29. We're going to try to go to Bunya to read chapter 29. Thank you, Manal (laughs) Alatwari. Without restraint, one dwells um, the country. With restraint, one decides diligently. And how monks does one dwell the country? If one dwells without restraint over the eyes and spade, the mind is soiled among them recognizable by the eyes. If the mind is soiled, this is no greatness. When there is no joy, there is no tranquility, calm. When there is no tranquility, one dwells is discontentedness. The mind of one who is discontent does not become concentrated. When the mind is not concentrated, experience do not become easily recognizable or clear in the mind because experience do not become easily recognizable or clear in the mind. One is considered as one who dwells neglectantly. Similar discourse. discourses are spoken in the case of ear sense bed, the nose sense bed, the tongue sense bed, the body sense bed, and the mind sense bed. Is this in such a way monks does one dwell neglectantly? And how monks does one decide neglectantly? If one decides with the restraint over the eyes and space, the mind is not soiled among from the recognizable by the eyes. If the mind is not soiled, gladness is born. When one is granted, joy is born. When the mind is afflicted by joy, the body becomes tranquil, calm. When tranquil in body experiences concentratedness. The mind of one who is content becomes concentrated. When the mind is concentrated, experience becomes easily recognizable or clear in the mind. Because experiences become easily recognizable or clear in the mind, one is considered as one who resides 
diligently. Similar discourses are spoken in the case of the ear sense bed, the nose sense bed, the tongue sense bed, the body sense bed, and the mind sense bed. This is in such a way, Mang. This one resides diligently. All right. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, that's great. So here, the Buddha is essentially talking about this restraint that by having restraint over the sense bases, this is diligence. And when we don't have restraint over the sense bases, then we're negligent in terms of what we're working towards. And by not having this restraint and dwelling negligently, he's saying that the mind is soiled. So there's no gladness because as long as there's craving and yearning in the mind, you're going to experience temporary pleasant feelings sometimes. But because the mind is soiled, you're going to also experience sadness and anger and frustration. So there can't be gladness. There can't be this permanent gladness. You can only have it temporarily. And there can be no joy. And there can be no tranquility because the mind's going up and down and up and down and up and down. So if we're negligent and looking over the sense spaces and we're not restraining the mind, observing this longing and yearning and pulling the mind back, then we're going to continue to experience the soiled mind with no gladness, no joy, no tranquility, and there's going to continue to be discontentedness. But conversely, when we reside diligently and we have restraint over the sense bases, then the mind isn't soiled with craving, desire, attachment. It's not polluted with craving, desire, attachment. And that's where gladness can come into the mind. This joy, this uplifting joy. The mind becomes tranquil so that the body then becomes tranquil or calm. And then as we do this, our mind becomes more clear. Here the Buddha is talking about the mind becomes concentrated experiences become easily recognizable or clear in the mind. This is where I talk about the advantages of the enlightened mind is that there's focus, there's concentration, there's clarity of mind, and there's this deep memory. Because as long as the mind's polluted, the mind is what the Buddha calls muddled. But when you clear out the pollution of something like central desire, then the mind can experience this focus, concentration, clarity of mind, and deep memory. And the Buddha is explaining that as a clear in the mind. And this is then helping you in your personal and professional relationships. Because as long as the mind is craving with central desire through these sense spaces, you're going to make selfish decisions in your personal and professional relationships. You're going to lack concentration. The mind's going to be muddled. And you're going to find it more difficult to perform in these situations. But when you clear out the mind of the pollution, and now the mind is not longing and yearning for certain selfish desires through the central desire. Now the mind can have this concentration and this clarity, and now your personal professional relationships can blossom because you're making decisions based on the best interest of all those involved rather than fulfilling our own cravings through our central desires. What questions do you guys have on this one? It doesn't appear there are any questions, sir. Okay. So we'll go to the very last chapter. Go to Miranda for the reading. Thank you, Manal. Diligence is declared to be the chief. Monks, whatever beings there are, whether those without feet or those with two feet, or those with four feet or those with many feet, whether consisting of form or formless, whether insightful, non-insightful, or neither insightful nor non-insightful, the Tathagata, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one, is declared to be the chief among them. So too, whatever wholesome states there are, they are all rooted in diligence, merge upon diligence, and diligence is declared to be the chief among them. When a monk is diligent, it is to be predicted that he will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. The Tathagata also made analogies of diligence being the chief with the following. Elephant's footprint being the chief among footprints of all living beings. Roof peak being the chief among all the rafters of a peaked house. Black forest being the chief among all fragrant roots. Red sandalwood being the chief among all fragrant heartwoods. Jasmine being the chief among all fragrant flowers. Wheel turning monarch being the chief among all petty princes. Radiance of the moon being the chief among the radiance of all the stars. The sun in autumn, when the sky is clear and cloudless, 
shines and beams and radiates. Cassian cloth being the chief among all woven cloths. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here there's kind of a common theme throughout the chapters that we've been exploring today, which is diligence, being determined, being dedicated, not complacent. Because when we allow the mind to be negligent or complacent, then we just allow those central desires to permeate in the mind. This unwholesome mental state is just continuing to long and yearn. It's like this wild animal, you know, just yearning and longing through these sense spaces. But when we practice having determination and dedication and diligence, the Buddha is saying this is chief among them. This is the highest priority or one of the highest priorities that ensuring that you remain and reside diligent in your practice, not only in meditation and ensuring that you're meditating regularly and building that up and finding it easier and easier to meditate each day, but also in daily life where you observe these bodily sensations arising due to the discontentedness that is coming into the mind, be diligent to cut that off and let that go. Because that's where you're making real progress. That's where you're eliminating the craving, desire attachment so that it's no longer subject to future arising. That as long as there's craving, desire attachment in there, there's going to be some discontentedness that arises. But when you eliminate the craving, desire attachment by cutting off any discontentedness that is arising as bodily sensations, then you're eliminating the craving desire attachment and it won't arise discontentedness in the future. That's what he's describing here is remaining diligent, having that mindfulness, that awareness of the mind longing through these sense spaces. And then when it latches onto something and discontentedness is starting to arise, be aware of those bodily sensations cutting them off and letting it go. And that's where you're starting to get to real liberation because now you're starting to control the mind and have this discipline of the mind. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? doesn't appear there are any questions, sir. All right. So next week, we're going to be exploring chapters 31 through 40. So you guys can read those ahead of time if you like. Read them maybe even after class if you like. This is a way to really soak the teachings into the mind. And the way that I suggest you guys do this is just read like maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes per day. That allows you to kind of slowly trickle the teachings into the mind because then you're still working on breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation. You're still ensuring that you're developing the Eightfold Path and all those factors as well. So if you just kind of got this trickling of the teachings little by little, you know, this allows you to just gradually build up your practice more and more each time. So thank you all for those of you that read, those of you that participated, asked questions, the moderators, thank you all for being dedicated and diligent in your practice. This is the best thing that you could ever do for your practice is remaining diligent over a consistent long-term period. This is why I say that your enlightenment isn't going to be determined based on necessarily what you do right now. You know, if you skip a meditation here or there, What's really important is that you remain dedicated and diligent over a long-term period of consistently coming to class, consistently meditating, consistently reading, consistently seeking guidance over a long-term period. And that's where the mind truly gets to liberation. It's not just a three-month thing. It's not a six-month thing. It takes some time. And there can be challenges along the way, but this is the last challenge of all challenges. Once you overcome this struggle of understanding these teachings and then practicing them in daily life, then the mind will eliminate this discontentedness and then you can enjoy the peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy for the rest of your life. But you've got to do that work in order to do that and remain diligent. So next week on Saturday, we'll be doing chapters 31 through 40. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we're in chapter one of the very first volume, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. We're going to be discussing that and going through the book chapter by chapter every Sunday. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be doing loving kindness meditation. I'll be helping you guys over a four-part series build up your practice of loving kindness meditation, which addresses the ill will, that aversion that we talked about a little bit today. It addresses this in the mind. So thank you all for joining. We'll see you in a future class. Have a very wonderful and lovely rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. 
To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.